navigate him. So my name is Amy Bach, and I am uh, here in San Francisco, which is the United Policyholders' home office. Um, and we're going to be going through this evening um, a brief webinar on navigating the contents portion of your claim uh, and communicating effectively with your adjuster or insurer in connection with your Woolsey Fire claim. So, of course, um, I want to uh, share that we um, uh, have already done two workshops, uh, but my guess is most or all of the folks online tonight did not attend those. So um, we're picking up where we left off on those two, but we're going to go back and review some basics. Um, upcoming help events on um, March 23rd, we will be hosting uh, a, another live one of our workshops again at the Thousand Oaks Library. It's going to be on a Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m., March 23rd. We're going to be drilling down on some of the material we're covering tonight. Um, and again, it'll be in person. And that will be um, at, in the Marvin E. Smith Community Room, 1401 East Jams Road in Thousand Oaks. Uh, also coming up uh, before then, we are uh, co-hosting a clinic, a free legal help clinic with Pepperdine Law School. And um, you'll be able to sign up for a free um, consultation with a volunteer lawyer that has expertise in insurance um, from our organization. And then there will be some volunteer lawyers um, that Pepperdine Law is bringing in as well. Um, and that, again, is free. And that will be on March 7th, which is a Thursday from 6 to 8 in the evening. Coming up this weekend, coming Saturday, March 2nd, um, I really encourage you, if you are having any problems with your insurance claim, with your adjuster, um, and you have questions, you can call 1-800-927-4357. Uh, which is the Department of Insurance, and you can schedule a free confidential appointment with one of their staff. And these folks are, uh, they're, they call them insurance policy officers, so they're not lawyers, uh, but they are claim help folks that are trained to process complaints from consumers and help answer basic questions. So um, again, you can sign up for one of those appointments free of charge, and that'll be this coming Saturday. There'll be a, a one hour town hall where you can um, ask questions in the public forum. The insurance commissioner, Ricardo Lara, will be there. And then you can uh, sign up for a one on one appointment after that. And that's going to be uh, in Agora Hills. Um, the information is here on the slide and it's also on our website. So, about UP, we are a not for profit charity. So, um, we don't sell anything. Um, and. Our Roadmap to Recovery program aims to educate and support you in navigating a fair insurance settlement. So we're funded by donations and grants, but we don't sell insurance and we are not able to represent people as their lawyers. Um, I happen to be a lawyer, but um, that is not the business that we're in. Um, our business is in helping you, the consumer, get a fair shake with, from your insurance company. A lot of our work gets done by volunteers who have recovered from previous disasters and knowledgeable consumer-oriented professionals. You can learn more about our work at our website, uphelp.org. Um, we run three programs. The Roadmap to Recovery, that's uh, the program that I'm here uh, talking to you about today. Um, we also do preparedness work. Uh, we publish a book called Wise Up, which helps people make good decisions about their insurance before a loss, obviously. Um, that's not so useful to you guys now. Um, uh, then the third program is Advocacy in Action. And that's where we fight for your rights as an insurance consumer. Um, and we advocate um, for you with the Department of Insurance, with courts, in the legislature, in the media. And we speak out about the problems that people experience, particularly after disasters, some of the things we'll be talking about tonight. Um, we're the publishers of something called the Little Yellow Book. We have um, enough funding to give those away um, at our live events. Um, and if you don't have one, I encourage you to come to the workshop on March 23rd, and we will be giving them away there. Um, we offer 24-7 help on the web at uphelp.org, and then you can backslash 
and type in Woolsey. So uphelp.org backslash Woolsey. We've curated a library for the Woolsey Fire. Um, we encourage you to use that library. We offer guides for overcoming obstacles, links to government and professional help, tips from past disaster survivors, and sample letters and claim forms to help you with your documentation. A little bit of fine print. We don't sell insurance or accept money from insurance companies, but we do know a lot about insurance. Uh, we don't give legal advice. This presentation is intended to be general guidance only, and we don't endorse or warrant the quality or services of any of the volunteers or the sponsors listed at our website. Um, obviously, our goal is to give you accurate information and not to push you in one direction or the other. Uh, so just a few thoughts that we want to share with you um, as far as what kind of a state of mind we recommend that you have. Um, we want you to understand that in the context that you're in, um, knowledge equals power. And the more you understand about your insurance benefits, your rights, and the value of your losses and your benefits, um, the more benefits you'll recover, the more insurance money you will recover to repair or rebuild your home and life, and the smoother your claim will go. Um, we want you to think of your insurance claim more as a business transaction than, say, the kind of touchy-feely situation that insurance commercials, you know, will will make it look like, oh, it's, you know, we're, you're in good hands, you know, we've got you covered, we've got your back. Those are ads, and, and that's not to say that, you know, your insurance companies have to cheat you and, you know, they're evil. That's not the message I'm here to give you, but my message is to understand that this is a business transaction, right? Your insurance adjuster may be friendly, but they're not your friend because they are a for-profit business. So obviously, the more they pay out in claims, the less they have in profits. And since most insurance companies have to serve you, their policyholders, and their shareholders, and they have to pay their employees, they've got competing priorities. So you have to make yourself a priority to them. That's part of your job. When you've had a large loss, and you need to collect a large dollar amount from an insurance company, your job is to be proactive and look out for your own interests. Okay, don't, you know, we don't, we recommend that you not take that passive approach, which of course the commercials could make you think that you could. Well, my insurance company is going to take care of everything. Well, to a certain extent that's true, but also true is that you must trust but verify. You must sometimes get second opinions on the value of, of your losses and also on what your rights are. Uh, because it's really you that has the biggest stake in having your loss accurately documented and valued. And that's why we recommend that you be proactive in making sure that happens. And sometimes that means spending some money to get a second opinion to what your insurance adjuster has said about the value of your uh, property. Sometimes you do need to pay a little bit of money to really make a strong case to the insurance company for what it is that you feel is fair. Um, but of course, you have already paid when you bought insurance, you've already paid for insurance protection and claim service. So you shouldn't have to pay twice. But the reality is when large dollars are at stake, sometimes you need to push a little bit and you need to be armed with documentation. Adjusters vary in personality and experience. That is for absolutely sure. Um, so we just want you to understand the reality of the dynamic between you and your insurance company, and we want you to find and use leverage, meaning, okay, here's the big insurance company, and here's you. Where do you get leverage? You get leverage from your local elected officials, your, your statewide officials. You get leverage from the Department of Insurance. You get leverage from the letters you write and the, and the records you keep. You get leverage from the proof that you can put together of how much it will cost to put you back where you were before your loss. And you can get leverage from the, the, the courts if you need to um, from, by hiring a lawyer. And again, those are, all, those are all ways that you can balance yourself against a very large, very experienced corporation 
that has their own language, wrote the policy, wrote the rules, um, that's, that's that imbalance. So a lot of what United Policyholders is about is empowering you to find your leverage and use your leverage and have a reasonably good experience in the claim process. Okay. Um, so uh, we very much encourage you to stay connected with other fire survivors, uh, neighbors, particularly if you can find other people who are insured with the same company as you, um, you know, and you form a group, that's a great thing. I understand the Malibu Times has been trying to help people kind of do that. Um, but whatever you can do to get email addresses for other people that are insured, but with the same company as you, that can be super helpful. Um, very important source of both pragmatic information about what their adjuster is telling them versus what your adjuster is telling you. And then of course, an important source of emotional support because it can feel um, obviously for some people, um, the insurance process feels like a second disaster, but for other people it doesn't. So of course we are here to try to help you, again, have a reasonably decent experience. No one wants to be in this situation, but here you are. Um, so again, what are some of the tips that we offer for um, getting through this? Keep a recovery diary, a journal. Uh, we have one that we have made, um, gotten made, but it is not, there's nothing magic about it. Don't feel like you're um, at a disadvantage if you don't have it. Um, we will be uh, giving away some of these at the legal clinic on March 7th. Um, we will be giving them away at our workshop on March 23rd. But all you need is, is any old notebook will do. This one happens to have three, to, three sections, so it's divided. So you can have one section for your dwelling claim, one section for your contents, and then one section for other stuff. And then um, this one has a business card holder, so you can keep track of um, business cards of people that you're dealing with. So, but what do you write in this thing? You, you make a record of what has been happening in connection with your loss, and your, and your re path to recovery, your insurance claim, um, dealings you may be having about debris removal, um, you know, if you're, if you're starting to shop for a contractor, um, that, you keep track of that there. But most important is to keep a record of your communications with your insurance company. Who said what, when, what's been agreed to, what is still open, what's undetermined, what is in dispute. Um, you know, it's not, normal for most people to keep a diary or journal after the age of you know 13 um, but it is incredibly important in this scenario most people who have gone through a tragic kind of an event like this are not in their right state of mind you know people call it sort of the new normal cloudy mind people tend not to be sleeping well lots of stress um, and again um, you know the the process is is a lot uh, the insurance claim process is is, is um, not the same uh, for each person because each adjuster is different, your policies may be different, and your loss may be different, and you may be different. Um, so we, we really recommend keeping a journal um, so that you can stay on track and you don't have to try to remember what happened or what did, what did that adjuster say um, because it's very typical that you will be dealing with more than one adjuster. Now, we're not in the same room, so I can't ask for a show of hands, um, but when we did a workshop in, for the Paradise, um, in Paradise for the campfire last week, I asked for a show of hands of how many people have already had more than um, two adjusters, and lots of hands went up. Three adjusters, lots of hands went up in a big room full of people. And it went all the way up. There were a couple of people who have already had six adjusters assigned. So there's, that's, again, why you want to keep a journal. Um, and that's just a reality for um, insurance companies. They just don't have, um, you know, an infinite number of adjusters. So um, they will typically, there will be some turnover um, in, in adjusters. You know, they'll typically bring folks out from out of state, and then they go back. And, of course, um, you know, the Woolsey fire came on the heels of the Thomas fire and also the camp fire. So it's, it's um, you know, I'm not defending, you know, insurers in this way, but it's just a reality. It'd be great if you could have one adjuster from the beginning to the end of your claim, but in catastrophe claims, that's rare.
Recovering from a disaster, we say, is a marathon, not a sprint. Why do we say that? Not to freak you out um, or bum you out, but just to have you understand that you're sort of in this for the long haul and to kind of try to get comfortable and, and understand that you don't need to make every decision right away. Another point, give your insurance company a chance to do the right thing, but don't be a pushover. Okay, that's an important one. Uh, when inter interacting with your insurance company, the two words that describe the best demeanor we think you can adopt, the approach you should take, polite assertiveness, right? So you are being as nice as you can and patient, but you're being assertive. So you're that squeaky wheel that's going to get paid. You know, and, and again, it can be, it's easy for me to sit here and, you know, um, in, in an office and say, oh, you know, be patient. Um, we fully recognize how tough this is. Um, I've been doing this kind of work, this kind of education recovery support work since 1991. And so I, I fully understand how challenging this is. Um, but again, so, you know, we're just giving you information that we have distilled from working with folks for all these years, um, particularly after wildfires, where everything's gone, it's so disorienting and you have so little in the way of proof. And that, that's what makes it so hard. Um, okay, but there's a lot of help available. I, I wanna always remind people that there's a lot of help that's gonna be available to you and that's probably already been offered to you. Okay, starting from understanding what you're entitled to, read, reread and reread your policy. The declarations page, which is that front page usually that has the name, the address, policy number, um, your buckets of coverage, your what we call endorsements, add-ons, riders, uh, make a working copy of your policy so you can scribble on, on it. Um, if, you're, if you don't have it by now, you should. The insurance company should absolutely have given it to you. Um, sometimes people trip over, oh, I've heard I'm supposed to get a certified copy. Ideally, you get a certified copy because then that can, there's no question that that is the contract that's in force. Um, sometimes you ask an adjuster for that and they say, what? Um, and again, if it's, you know, if you really want to get that certified copy and they won't, you're sure you'd ask for it. And again, we offer a sample letter on our website that you can adapt to get that certified copy. Um, if it's important you can, to you to get that certified copy rather than just a, a complete current one, which is fine too, you can go to the Department of Insurance and, and tell them you need help getting a certified copy. Okay, um, once you've done the math to calculate the available policy benefits, um, then you have a good starting place. Um, if you're confused now, you know, a couple months out, um, definitely you can get help from a DOI that would be like this Saturday you can go to the town hall or to the get an appointment um, or you can file a consumer request for assistance with the department anytime that's the state agency that oversees insurance companies you can also get help from an advocate an experienced public adjuster or a lawyer who represents policyholders that's you the holder of an insurance policy. So it's just a fancy word for you, the insurance consumer. This is, a, this is what a typical declarations page may look like. It shows you the main coverages for the four big buckets, dwelling, other structures, personal property, and loss of use. And then you see the endorsements. You see that this sample has a $1,000 deductible. You see that it has um, a a limited uh, home replacement cost endorsement, which gives this person 150% of their coverage A, their 300,000 uh, limit, they would get the 300,000, it's available to them, $300,200, and then they get a 50% of that, so another 150, um, and so their total would be 450, um, under this endorsement. That's the max that would be available under this policy under a very kind of quick read of this. There may be other formula formulas in the policy that will bump that up. There will be, in this one, you've got building code upgrade um, of 75,000. That should bump it up above that 450, which is the adjusted A, adjusted because of that endorsement, plus 
the code upgrade coverage. So that's just a sample, all right? Um, if you have a mobile or manufactured home, you generally are gonna have those same four buckets of coverage. Um, you're probably gonna have lower limits in all the categories, um, and you may be facing a fight over the valuation of, of, of replacing that, that home. Um, because they typically mobile homes, manufactured homes, um, tend to depreciate pretty fast. Learn the lingo, um, and this goes to being that, in, that squeaky wheel that's gonna get painted. Um, these are uh, some terms that you wanna get a basic understanding of if you are, if your insurance company hasn't just maxed you out in all the categories, which sometimes they will do for people who are very underinsured. Sometimes, Insurance companies will skip over some of the hoops that they typically will make you jump through and cut you checks for your benefits, your maximum limits, but usually when they know that you're very underinsured. Under normal, in a normal situation, for most people, there is going to be some, some pr processes, some hoops that the insurance company will make you jump through to collect the full benefits to which you're entitled. They're going to apply depreciation to some things. Um, and so you need to understand what that is. You need to understand actual cash value, which is a depreciated value, replacement cost value, holdbacks that are recoverable. That's when they depreciate. They reduce the value of your loss, either temporarily or permanently, depending on how the contract reads. Some of your benefits are payable on a replacement cost basis, and some of them are payable on an actual cash value basis. So if things that are payable ACD only, you don't recover that depreciation that they held back. Depreciation is the loss in value for an item of personal property, that's what we're focusing on tonight, from all causes including age, wear and tear. Depreciation is always negotiable. Push for what's fair. Now, what's an example of something that an insurance company will depreciate temporarily? Well, let's say you have a couch and you, and you put that on your inventory. They're gonna depreciate it. They're gonna, generally, they're gonna offer you, okay, we're depreciating this, like say the replacement value of this couch is 5,000. They depreciate it down to 1,000 because of its age and wear and tear, its condition then you can get that 4,000 back once you replace that couch. So that's an example of, of a holdback that's recoverable. That's temporary, not permanent depreciation because you can go back and collect the difference, right? But if something is only insured for actual cash value, you're never gonna get that depreciated amount back. Okay, so obviously it matters how much they depreciate your stuff. Um, Actual cash value is the pre-loss value of an item. This is sometimes explained as the, the Craigslist price, or the price a willing buyer would have paid you right before the event that caused your loss. Replacement cost is the price that would, it would actually cost to repair or replace a damaged or destroy, destroyed item right now. Most policies they, these days are replacement cost policies. That does not apply to a fair plan policy. Some of you may have fair plan policies. Most of the coverage in a fair plan policy is on an actual cash value basis. But again, if you have replacement cost coverage, then to collect the full amount you're entitled, you typically have to actually replace items, send the receipts to the insurer, and demand the balance they owe you. And I can tell you that a lot of people never get around to doing that. So one of the, the tips that we're gonna go through here briefly are, okay, given that I may never get back the depreciation, either because um, I, I don't end up replacing the thing or I, for, or I just you know, can't deal anymore and I wanna put the thing behind me, um, the best thing, of course, is to negotiate the, the highest value um, that you can on your inventory. Um, and, and try to not have to go back for everything. Okay, so just some tips on the contents portion of your claim. Obviously your goal to collect the full amount your insurer owes you for every item that was damaged or destroyed by either one of three ways. You can either prepare your own list 
an inventory and submit that along with receipts as you replace things. You can hire a professional to help you do that, or you can negotiate a waiver of that inventory requirement, which means get your insurance company to say, okay, we're not gonna make you do the inventory, um, which is something that can be done sometimes with some insurance companies, um, but, the, but typically um, the, your insurer is gonna make you do that inventory. Okay, depreciation is negotiable. Um, just remember that. There's no official standard. It's not like the IRS has a depreciation, depreciation schedule that's fixed. Insurance companies do are all over the map on their depreciation schedules. Um, it can be hard to pin down an adjuster on how they depreciated things. Um, but, it, but again, in California, um, we have really strong consumer protection laws in the state. You know, if you're going to lose your house in a wildfire, do it in California. We have a lot of protections um, that you can you can take advantage of if you need to. And one of them is that when an insurance company applies depreciation to your claim, it must be based on the condition and not just the age of the item. So that gives you wiggle room to argue, hey. This, you're overly depreciating this item because just because it was old, it wasn't in bad shape. But again, these are, you know, this is negotiation between you and your adjuster. But you can ask in writing for your insurer to give you a copy of the depreciation schedule they use. Like I said, age isn't everything. Condition can be more important than age. Here's a perfect example, uh, our, the, my, our favorite one, the couch. Um, here you've got a couch. Um, owned by a family with no children, five-year-old sofa, eh, maybe that would depreciate 20%. You know, no one's allowed to eat on it. You can see um, these folks are not even sitting on it. Um, but then you compare the same sofa, same age, in a family with kids and pets, that thing is going to depreciate maybe 80% at the same five-year mark just because it's probably dirty and ripped up and, you know, that kind of thing. So again, you can see that age and condition matter. Um, very common um, to have an adjuster try to shortcut and, and, and just depreciate things excessively and across the board. Um, I'm going to try to zoom through here a little so I make sure we have um, a few minutes for questions. Um, on our website, we do offer um, some depreciation guide support for you to, to look at, to see some of, and again, you know, we don't recommend you fight over the depreciation on small things, um, but where it really matters are the big ticket items, you know, large items of furniture, valuables, um, etc. cetera. Um, if your adjuster tries to apply a fixed depreciation percentage across the board, like we're just gonna depreciate your whole inventory by 30%, that's not, legal, so to challenge that. Um, negotiate depreciation and holdbacks on a case-by-case -case basis um, based on the condition of each item. Okay, you can also argue um, that depreciation should be based on the remaining life expectancy of an item, not necessarily its age. So here's the example. Let's say you had a guest room that had shag carpet from 1970. According to the insurer's depreciation schedule, that carpet should have only lasted five years. But however, in your case, since the room is rarely used, sorry that you don't have more guests, sorry or not sorry, or didn't have more, um, that carpet actually is in like new condition it was. So in that scenario, you could argue that the remaining life expectancy of the carpet is still five years and no depreciation should be taken at all um, because under the insurer's argument, that carpet wore out 28 years ago. Obviously, that, that didn't happen. So this is just an example of how you can be arguing. Here are some items that should not be subject to any depreciation. Antiques, fine art, jewelry, musical instruments. And I threw in labor. We're talking about contents tonight. We talked about dwelling in our last workshop. Um, but labor is one of those bones of contention between a lot of claimants and their insurance companies, labor should not be depreciated because, um, and that's, that relates to your home, not your stuff. Um, but it's just a point I want to make because again, um, we want you 
to be treated fairly. And part of that is we don't want you to be subject to excessive depreciation on things because that reduces the amount of money that you collect. Strategically speaking, I think I said this before, you're unlikely to replace everything you had and it's a hassle to have to keep providing receipts. So try to maximize your ACV payments by arguing for lower depreciation and by identifying the true replacement cost of your items at standard, not discount retailers, and try and reach an agreement with your adjuster, okay? Um, like I said, adjusters have different personalities. Insurance companies have different philosophies. Um, some adjusters may say, I'm gonna send you somebody to help you with your inventory. If they do, fine, sit down with that person. Um, if they don't, then you're on your own unless you get outside help, okay? We offer a lot of free resources. We know from all our years, this is a tough one. You know, putting, you know, the, the you know, trying to force your heart and your mind to um, go back to a painful place of remembering valuable things that you don't have anymore, that is really rough. And for some people, it takes them well over a year to do their inventory and they get extensions and that is normal, very common. Um, some people just want to get it over with as soon as they can. Whatever strategy works for you and your family is the one that you should pursue. Um, we offer a free spreadsheet on our website. Um, actually, we've made it easy. If you go to uphelp.org um, backslash and you type in download, that's going to take you to the free downloads we offer of an Excel spreadsheet you can use to do your inventory. It's got thousands of items. It's divided by room. All you have to do is you can cross off the things you didn't have, add in the values, and you can use that inventory. Most people get a form from their insurance company, but you really can use whatever um, process works for you to do your inventory. Also, in the back of our little yellow book, if you have that, um, is a, it, for those of you who are not super internet users, um, we have a very long um, inventory guide in here that will help you, memory jogger, to remember things. Um, and then again, we have a lot of re more resources on our website, um, and there's lots of resources online. I have to remind you, claim only what you lost. Never intentionally claim items you didn't have. That's fraud and it's illegal. And not only that, but it's, it, is, it is very useful to try to keep as much of a trust relationship as you can with your adjuster to keep things moving. And that, I know, again, can be hard. You know, when somebody is, is um, you know, ignoring your calls or ignoring your emails, blowing you off or making you repeat yourself, it's hard. Um, you know, to, to be patient. Um, again, but that's why we say um, keep that journal um, because you do have to cooperate with your insurance company. That is, that is a duty that you do have. Um, and so, uh, you know, if they think that you're claiming things you didn't have, that's going to erode that trust relationship, and that's going to make your claim just a lot harder. So it's just never a good idea. Um, so you have two tasks if you are doing your own inventory. Brainstorming and listing. You can get friends to help. Take advantage of memory joggers. And then determining the value. The internet is your best friend um, if you can access it. Find the method that works best for you. It could be a spreadsheet um, that we give you. Um, it could be technology. You can, there are stores that have gift registry scanners. You can pretend that you're registering for, that you're getting married and you take, you get, they'll give you the little clicker. You can walk around a big box store, click, 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 towels, click, 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 and that will help. Um, and again, the internet is great. Your credit card companies um, should have the records of big items you, you have charged. Um, friends and family can help. You know, they will, you may be able to get friends and family to help you, you know, do a little inventory party where they, you know, have, have a you know, glass of wine or some tea and, you know, have them help you. Oh, I remember you had this and that. Um, again, it's, it's, um, it's painful, but if you can just remember that lots and lots of people have gone through this, you're going to get through it. 
um, you know, and you just got to take your time when you need time um, and then, you know, just try to get it over with. Um, visualizing the room uh, can be helpful, especially if you do it with your eyes closed. Um, these days, you know, insurance companies seem more and more willing to let people group things instead of making them, making you list every, you know, every spice to, that was in your cabinet. Instead, you know, you can say, you know, 30 bottles of spices, you know, average cost $5 or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, dress shirts, suppose you had enough dress shirts to fill up 30 inches of closet space, you know, um, count them, you know, go to a friend's house, um, find an average price. Again, you know, you can be creative as long as you're being reasonably honest. Um, generally, if you give your insurance adjuster information, the information they need to say yes, um, you know, that's going to be your best strategy. Estimating quantities, you know, measuring, go to a bookstore and measure, you know, um, a bookshelf and, and find an average price by the kinds of books that you have. Keep a running list on you. If you're a cell phone person, if you have an iPhone, use the notes feature to jot down things as you remember them. Um, you know, again, um, I can't soft pedal this. Many people have described completing their personal property inventory as the most emotionally draining aspect of the insurance recovery process. Um, but again, you will get through it. Um, and no one but you can assess your tolerance for this process. Um, you know, people will say, people have said to me many times, you know, I can't do this anymore. I hate to leave money on the table. Well, okay, don't feel like, you know, you have failed. If you get as far as you can with your inventory on your own, and you have to pay somebody to finish it, that's okay. Or if you leave a little bit of money on the table, that's okay. You know, time is money. The heart has to heal. You have to heal. Um, choosing the best path for your family and your finances is the way to go. Um, let me talk briefly about this inventory waiver deal. So, like I said, the contract, the insurance policy says you have got to prove what you lost. You've got to do this inventory. Typically, the insurance company will give you, um, sometimes they'll talk about 60 days, but they usually will give you well over a year, sometimes two years, to finish your inventory. If they are jamming you, that's something that you go to the Department of Insurance for help. Generally, insurance companies will give you extensions. And you have, under California law, up to three years to collect your replacement value um, above the depreciation. So you've got time here. Um, but getting your insurance company to waive that inventory requirement can be hard. It, it is a long shot, but it definitely can be done, and it has been done. Um, if you look at, for example, uh, the results of, our, uh, of a survey we did in 2007 um, after um, a wildfire in San Diego, that was a very vocal, politically loud community. They put a lot of pressure on the insurance commissioner. The insurance committee commissioner turned around and put a lot of pressure on the insurance companies. And by gosh, 39% of the, of the folks who responded to our survey were able to get their insurance company to waive the inventory requirement. That said, that's not the law. We tried to make it the law. We were not able to overcome the insurance companies. So it's still a, a, something you have to negotiate. Um, I will say there are maybe other important reasons to complete your contents inventory. For example, your income taxes um, may be a reason. Okay, so sample letters, uphelp.org, backslash samples, lots of help there, professional help. Public adjusters um, and or home inventory specialists probably have already solicited you. They, if they are reputable and their references check out and their fee is reasonable, no shame in hiring help. Um, we, if you are a person who's either got any kind of disability or you work full time or you have little kids or you are elderly and you just are, are struggling, um, you know, it, it, it very well may be that um, paying out a, a, a you know, seven to 10% 
of your claim to a public adjuster may be the right path for you. Um, but again, you know, just like every other profession, there are good ones and then there are not so good ones. And before you sign on the dotted line, you must talk to some satisfied clients, at least one. <clears throat> um, and we offer lots of tips for hiring professional help. So I'm gonna to try to wrap up. Generally speaking, be polite but assertive to ensure that you recover the fair settlement you're entitled to. Give your insurance company a chance to, do, to fulfill its promises and do right by you, but don't be a pushover. Remember, this is a business negotiation with a for-profit company. There are lots of laws to protect you. California has more laws. In fact, we have so many laws and regulations that apply to disaster insurance claims that a lot of the adjusters that come in from out of state don't even know about them. Now that's not right. They should be trained and they should know. But a lot of the time, an adjuster may tell you that you're not entitled to something because in the states where they work, that is true. But in California, you may be. So we really encourage you to use our website, come to our workshops, watch the free videos that we have on our website. You can um, go to the, uh, our, the Woolsey landing page. You can go down that page and see some of the, the, um, the workshops that we've done. You can go to our 2017 North Bay Fires website. There's like 13 videotaped Roadmap to Recovery workshops on every topic you could possibly need. <clears throat> then again, it wasn't your fire, but the same rules apply. So empower yourself, educate yourself, um, and now I welcome your questions. If you have one, um, hopefully we're gonna figure out how this is going to work. Do we have questions? Yes, please. This is Sandy here. So um, anybody who has a question can go down to the bottom. There's a little chat screen and you can type in your questions and then I can uh, read them to Amy. Anybody has, has them? Here we go. Um, okay, so the first question is from Kathy. I have a partial loss. The State Farm Insured Engineer found 50 burn marks on my roof. They will not pay for a complete replacement. They want me to look for 50 shingles. I can't get a roofer to quote for 50 shingles. Okay, I'm gonna give a short answer and give Sandy a chance to add on. So, um, First of all, very sorry that you are dealing with this. Um, again, not, not, you're not the only one. Um, we often say partial losses can be even harder to navigate than total losses um, because there's some subjectivity involved. Obviously, the house isn't completely gone. So um, in a situation like that, first of all, you've got your paper trail where you're documenting they've made an unreasonable request you're gonna get an estimate from a qualified, reputable roofer um, who's, who has actually inspected your roof. Um, so you're gonna get a second opinion from what State Farm is saying. Um, you're gonna read the policy, and if you feel that, and you cannot get them to come around to a fair resolution, then you file a complaint with the Department of Insurance. If you still can't get a fair resolution, then you, if there's enough money at stake to get a good lawyer to represent you on a contingent fee basis, then you know. Then you then you go to the mat. Uh, but again, you are generally speaking entitled to have your property restored to its pre-loss condition, to like kind and quality, um, and not a patchwork appearance, unless there's some funky language in your policy. So, um, and if there is funky language that looks like it gives State Farm the right to do a patchwork repair, to only pay for a patchwork repair. Again, that's something that I recommend taking to the Department of Insurance because that's not the standard in California. Sandy, you want to add to that? No, I think that I think that, that was right. I think the main thing to do is to have uh, roofers look at it and have them write something up saying, you know, 50, 50 shingles. I could see if it was five shingles. You know, that would be a lot more reasonable. But 50 shingles, you know, depending on the size of your roof, that's a, that's a large, you know, a large bit. So I would just get the roofers out there, have them write something up for you, you know, saying that this isn't a, you know, a reasonable way to repair it and go from there. I think, you, I think you'll be okay in the end on that. Okay. More questions? Anybody else? 
I will say this is the first time that we're trying this format. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, uh, we, we very much do want to hear questions. Though, so if you have them, please just don't be shy. And type. Okay. We have another one from Riyadh. Uh, my original insurance, which was written with replacement cost basis, uh, was, re was written with replacement cost basis because my mortgage required that. Subsequently, I was dropped from my insurance and into the California Fair Plan. I think we're waiting for a little bit more here. Um, can you put the rest of your question in? Oh, there we go. Um, then since for the last four years, they have not had replacement cost coverage. Okay. And that's because probably through the California Fair Plan, there's some right. limited, limited right. coverage. Right. So um, definitely the Woolsey Fire hit areas that have been hit before. And typically, if you live in an area that's been hit by a wildfire in the past, um, there, there may be, you know, you, you, you may um, have had no choice but to go to the fair plan. And yes, their coverage is not as generous as what you get in a typical policy. The fact that, um, that technically you've been out of compliance with your mortgage, I guess, I guess the only remedy that I could see maybe would be if an insurance, if you had an insurance agent or broker that put you in the fair plan and didn't shop for you to get to find something outside the fair plan um, and they didn't advise you um, that, that, that this was, uh, that you could have options, that could be a remedy, but the fair plan coverage is kind of is what it is. Anything yeah. To add, Sandy? And it, well, it looks like he um, put in there that they had subsequently paid off their mortgage, so not being in compliance is probably not an issue. Um, the issue really is the fair plan and availability of insurance in these fire prone areas. So um, unfortunately, that's sort of one of the ways that these plans limit, you know, limit their exposure um, in, in these types of areas. Right. And so I think, again, you know, I, all the, what I was talking about earlier about why we encourage people to really fight for the highest actual cash value they can um, it's because of that, because, um, you know, some policies, that's all they're going to pay. Um, and also for some people, that's all that they ever end up collecting just because time marches on and et cetera. So again, um, using our depreciation guide will help you there. Yeah. Okay. So we have another question for, from Kathy is tree, this tree removal part of the tree coverage or does that fall under debris removal? Um, typically that's going to be debris. That's going to be debris removal. And then, and then you'll be looking to your trees and shrubs coverage to replace trees. Now, um, you know, and I, I'm not clear on uh, the, the rules of the, de the coordinated debris removal program down there um, or whether people are, um, having to think, having to pay out of pocket for debris removal, and I think for some people, if you if your coverage for debris removal is limited, you know you're going to want to focus on, of course, um, getting all the house debris cleared away so you can get the soil recompacted and 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 start to rebuild, um, and and the, the tree removal would be a second priority. But again, if you have enough debris removal coverage for both your your what the debris from the house and the trees it would go in there anything to add there sandy well i would just clarify some policies are different some policies specifically state that so you have to kind of read your policies some of them say that tree debris removal is part of the tree shrubs and plants coverages and some of it just falls under the general so it really kind of is policy specific for that um, and that and that being separate from all the consolidated debris removal coverage. Okay, so Michael has a question. Um, my insurer has agreed to pay and has now paid 70% of my personal property coverage without an inventory. It has been ambiguous whether we'll ever insist on an inventory. If I'm satisfied with the 70%, will I ever need to prepare an inventory? Um, if, 
the the short answer should be no. Um, but again, we always recommend uh, being that that kind of maybe not as as um, diligent as you might normally be in real life of writing things down. This is where you want to confirm in writing to your adjuster in an email or in, um, or or by you know good old fashioned U.S. mail. The, uh, this will confirm that we uh, that the seventy percent of our contents coverage that has been um, has been delivered to us uh, is that will, will not require us to complete an inventory. Um, if, you know, just to just to really button that down. Um, but I, I, you know, generally when they're paying you that seventy percent advance, that is on the condition that you don't have to do an inventory, and the only reason you'd have to do one is if you decided you wanted that extra 30%. And in that case, most of the insurers are saying, well, okay, then if you want the 100, then you have to do an inventory and you gotta start from dollar one and you gotta get it all the way up past the 70,000, the 70% 70 uh, to the full 100%, if, that's, if, if, that, if you can, if your inventory value actually goes up to or close to 100%. But, Okay. Um, again, so just, just, I mean, just to, just to really nail this down. So we have a new insurance commissioner starting in January, Ricardo Lara, the guy who's going to be out there this weekend. And again, I encourage you to go see him, uh, let him know what's happening. Um, but he, the guy who was in there before him, um, Dave Jones was very aggressive in pressuring insurance companies to not require inventories. And he was publishing lists of which insurance companies were giving people 70% without an inventory. Some were giving 80% without an inventory. Some even did 100. Um, and, but that was for uh, a previous wildfire. So for your wildfire, uh, it's really gonna be up, uh, partly up to your community to really get him to do the same thing Dave Jones did, which is to put pressure on the insurers publicly and say, come on, help these people out. You know, um, everything they had is gone. At least offer them 80%, which um, most people say, I take 80% of my contents if I didn't have to itemize. Uh, but again, you always have the option. If you don't, if you want every dollar, you always have the option of itemizing. Okay, so we have a question from Mike. The declarations page of my policy states that I have replacement cost coverage, but it doesn't specify a percentage limit in the doc. Oh, percentage limit in the documents I received when I purchased my policy. When I finally got the full plan after the fire, that is where the replacement percentage limit was disclosed. Is this typical? Uh, Go ahead, Sandy. I'm just going to chime in here and think that that's a little bit confusing. So there's no um, there's no specific replacement cost percentage. What I think you're looking at in your policy is probably the co-insurance clause that talks about whether or not you insured your your house to value, and that's generally an 80 percent. Um, they require you insure it to 80 percent of value in order to um insure it to value um if you want send me an email i can it's really complicated um co-insurance um and i wouldn't worry about it unless they're actually trying to limit your settlements mics but if you want to send me an email um at sandy at up s-a-n-d-y at uphelp.org i will help you out with that because that's that's going to confuse everybody if we get to, to right, and but let me just let me just say for for the benefit of everybody who has um, tuned in. Um, so if you remember, and I can go back um, to the slide, I think, <laughs> um, with the uh, with the sample uh, of the. Sorry, if I'm making anybody dizzy here. Um, don't look. <laughs> um, uh, here we go. Whoop. Okay. Um, so if you see on this slide, um, there is a limited home replacement cost endorsement, 150%, right? That's that, oh, that's right. that kicker, right? Okay. So this person, they had their $300,200 uh, of dwelling coverage. 
And then they have that 150%, which we talked about that math earlier, right? Which would, if they could show that 300,000 was not enough to put their house back, they would have up to 150% of that. So they would have up to 450 or so thousand, right? Because of that endorsement. But then you see below that, right? And, and we're hearing maybe this person who asked the question doesn't have that. Below that, we see replacement value endorsement, personal property. Those are two very different things. That, that first one was the applied to the home replacement. And the second one applied to the personal property and the, and the word, I, you know, they just, the stuff is, it, it's so darn confusing, but the word replacement in that line, replacement value endorsement personal property, all that means is not ACB, right? That just means this person gets full replacement value. Um, but so that may be part of also related to this question. Yeah, I think that's probably it. I'm sorry. I just okay. got way off on that. So, um, okay. okay. Terry uh, is asking the best way to find a home inventory specialist um, versus just hiring like a public adjuster. Right. Um, so, you know, I think we may have a couple of them listed in our find help directory. Um, and if, and if we don't, um, you know, certainly word of mouth. Um, we, we, um, we know, you know, I really, that's a tough one. If you don't find something in our find help directory, I think it's really going to be, you know, either, uh, is, if there's a, a listserv or if you're using next door or if you're using Facebook, if there's like a, you know, if you're, you're on a, a community recovery, um, website or listserv, ask, you know, has anybody, is anybody working with an inventory specialist, specialist that they like? Okay. Um, so Dave is asking for his mom. Her place is still standing. Some partial damage and cleanup is needed. There are some caveats for her to return in three to 10 months, possibly. We are hearing that if she needs a short-term apartment or living arrangement, they are denying the initial claim, stating that the living arrangements up there are okay, even though there's no water, electricity, amenities. How would we fight for additional living expenses to make sure she can live by herself until her place is ready? She has foremost insurance. Okay. So I definitely am going to have Sandy weigh in, but I'm going to give a little, um, again, just a quickie um, of the basics. So we did not talk about this category of benefits um, tonight, but it is a biggie um, on this uh, page that's on your screen. It's called loss of use. So additional living expense coverage is sometimes labeled as loss of use. Sometimes it's labeled as temporary living expenses. That's that category of benefits for that, that can cover you for expenses that you incur because you've lost the use of your home. So very often, uh, the, what, what you can claim for ALE is something you have to negotiate with your insurance company, right? Um, and we've been noticing a very uh, bad trend of insurance companies trying to kind of rush people back to their homes before those homes are safe to inhabit or um, kind of rushing people and saying, you're not moving fast enough, and so we're going to cut you off. Um, so Sandy, if you want to pick up on this question and answer where I just left off, that'd be great. Well, you know, I think this is a tough one. I'm assuming when you're saying up there, you're, you're talking about up north. Um, you know, the policies read a little bit differently, but in general, you know, it's if a loss insured causes the premises to become uninhabitable, they owe to maintain your standard of living until the house is, you know, uh, returned to the way that it was and I think water electricity um, and things like that are very important and making sure that the house has been cleaned properly remediated of smoke is very important um, I'm seeing some of the insurers that are denying the water issue as a contamination I think that's a mistake um, I think it's clearly there there was um, the law in California says you know the proximate cause if the proximate cause of the issue is covered then the loss is covered. Well, the proximate cause of this, this situation was fire. 
there was no intervening cause. You know, there's legal things about intervening cause. It's a straight result of the fire. So I think that eventually they're going to have to cave in. I see them doing it to a lot of people, especially up in the Paradise area. Um, and I would just keep, I would just keep fighting. I mean, she's electricity. I mean, that's key, and um, and water. So um, I would keep that. And I don't know, you know, if she's been staying with family. You know, she is entitled to stay someplace, you know, similar to where she lived before. So I would push for that right now as well. Yeah. And what I've been doing while Sandy uh, was answering that question was just a little experiment to show, um, show you guys before we sign off um, our website, uphelp.org, and how I find things, which as you saw, I use the search box. <clears throat> one of... Um, one of the publications that I think is really useful um, is this uh, is a survivor speak, which is it was written by people who kind of walk the where you're walking now, um, and, and sort of in hindsight, you know, giving suggestions about your ALE, um, and you'll find that by using that search box, um, and it, you know, we go through some of the examples of the things that you can claim, uh, but I would say. Um, you know, if, if you're helping, um, you know, a parent, if they're elderly, I mean, again, these are the kind of things that you really need to document in writing and say, um, you know, uh, this will confirm that, you know, my, my, my mother, um, you know, I needs my, I am helping my mother. Um, she's in a you know, vulnerable situation and this is causing her stress. I mean, that kind of color, um, you know, we don't recommend that you send, you know, two-page, single-spaced diatribes, you know, um, listing every bad thing that, that the adjuster may have done. But in a situation like this, pointing out that they are taking a position that's not reasonable, it's important to do that. Um, you know, and do it as kind of, as kind of facts, you know, stick to the facts. Um, but again, this is, this is some guidance. So we're gonna have to sign off. This was a one-hour um, experiment. We really appreciated. Oop, what happened here? Sharing is paused. Okay. Um, we do want feedback. Um, Carolyn at uphelp.org will be um, your first stop to you know uh, follow up on this. But again, um, I hope to see uh, some of you in person on March 23rd at our next workshop. I very much encourage you uh, to go uh, to. Agora Hells this weekend, if you can, on Saturday, on, on March 2nd, to the DOI forum. Um, that would be a great place to meet other people that may be insured with your same company. But again, we will be trying to facilitate that as well at our workshop on March 23rd. So I want to say, thank Carolyn Winter um, for setting this up. I want to thank Sandy Watts, um, uh, my, my fabulous teammate. Um, and I want to thank all of you who took the time to um, log in. Uh, this is something that we would be happy to do more of um, if, it, if it proves to be valuable. It's a great way for us to support you from afar um, we, when our funding and our resources are limited. Yeah, so, thanks everyone for, for joining. And we're rooting for you. <laughs> we are. Okay, and I think, okay. Uh,